Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I am joined by my co-host, Michael Hall. But we are also joined by a very, very special guest, the starting left tackle for Clemson and the NFL draft prospect, Jackson Carmen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Jackson. How are you doing? Doing great. Appreciate you for having me. Uh, absolutely, sir. And the first question I wanted to get and ask you was, you know, you were able to play your freshman and sophomore year um, at Clemson, and this year was totally different with COVID. How was that process for you, playing through COVID and um, playing ball? So there was a lot of sacrifices. We, not only me individually, but as a team, we had to make this year. Not going out, really having to abide by all the rules and protocols, being able to do everything we needed to do to be able to have a season. Because at one point, no one knew if we were going to have a season or not. Mm. So for us, getting COVID tested up to five times a week, always having to wear masks and different things like that. And ultimately just always being conscientious of your surroundings, different things that we had to go through. And like me personally, to be able to play this season with COVID. Right, right. And uh, sticking with the season, uh, you face a lot of tough pass rushers in the uh, ACC this season. Who was one of the toughest ones you went up against? Patrick Jones from Pitt, Quincy Roche from Miami, Tyreek Smith from Ohio State, the Notre Dame kids. All very talented pass rushers. Oh, oh nice. yeah, dude. And th those are names that are going to be talked about on Sundays along with yours, Jackson. Yeah. Now, my next question for you is the draft process. How has it been for you with COVID? You know, generally you have the combine. You're able to have these one-on-one -on -one meetings um, with scouts and uh, executives in front offices. So how has it been for you getting ready for the draft? So talking to a lot of my guys that are in the NFL right now, the, the process this year is a lot different than years past, especially with like just not having a combine and not being able to, be able to have that face-to-face -face interaction with teams and coaches. But I think the teams and everyone else has been doing a good job adjusting and adapting to be able to like have things like Zoom meetings, and conference calls, and different things of that nature for us to still be able to have that same relay of information and communication between teams. Mm, I, I, I absolutely love that. Right, right. Now, sticking with this draft process, you had a great season. Um, what are some of your strengths in your mind that you have, and what are some things you've been working on throughout this draft process? I feel like I've been working on every single aspect of my game. I wouldn't say there's a certain thing that I feel like I'm necessarily deficient in. I wouldn't also say there's a certain thing that I'm just elite or perfect in. And I feel like really trying to challenge myself to get better in every area is something I've been really working on. But as far as my strengths, I feel like I'm a really intelligent, thoughtful football player. I feel like I think fast, I can recognize things fast. And I really pride myself on my mind for the game. Also, I feel like I'm a very explosive athlete, a very fluid and balanced athlete. <laughs> Dude, your film, that screams out of your film, brother. I mean, I absolutely loved doing your film breakdown. And and uh, in, I was able to look at your hurdle profile, um, and I saw that in high school listed you also as a tight end. So you being 6'6", 335, and the way that you're able to move, was playing tight end early on in high school, was that able to kind of help you in that aspect? I think definitely that, but also the fact that I played basketball all growing up, mm. up until sophomore year of high school. And also doing other sports like outside of football, things like surfing or snowboarding or like like soccer, or just all just trying all types of things. Really being a well-rounded athlete in general builds to athleticism in football. Right, right. And uh, is there like a certain uh, pro pro level or college level that a guy that you watch film on, and certain guys you break down and kind of try to study their game, um, base your kind of your moves off of them? Yeah, I'm a definitely a film junkie. So there's tons of guys I love to watch. Trent Williams, Joe Staley, yes. Bakari, Stanley from the Ravens, Tunsil. Just, I feel like there's so many elite guys right now. And it's really right. special to be able to break apart their film and be able to take little bits and pieces from everybody and craft your own individual game. Yeah, and I have to ask you, you blocked as the blind side for the possible number one overall pick in Trevor Lawrence. You know, is there any added pressure with that for you, Jackson? How was that uh, going throughout the season, knowing that this kid has a, you know, very big importance for the NFL? Might have been a little pressure taken off just knowing that he would make me look good. <laughs> <laughs> it was an amazing experience blocking for Trevor. He's really just like a great person, a great player through and through. And being able to know that the, I have a confidence in myself to be able to protect somebody of that caliber, 
lets me know that it's not going to ever be a problem for me at the next level. Yeah, that's awesome. Right. And one question I wanted to ask you because some people I don't I don't believe it personally from what I've seen from your tape. But some people have listed you as a guard as well. Do you envision yourself strictly playing left tackle at the next level? Yes, sir. I do. I feel like I'm definitely going to be an elite level left left tackle in the NFL. Oh, man. Like my film and my attributes will speak to that. But also, ultimately, I'm a, I'm a very team-oriented player. And I feel like when I get on a squad or a club, whatever they feel like is in the best interest of the team, whatever they need for us to be able to win a Super Bowl, I'm going to do. And that's for me to be an elite level left guard or right guard or right tackle. I'm going to do it. Dude, that is you don't you can't have a better answer than that. I, was gonna say, I love that answer. I love that answer. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I have to ask you a question with in regards to the NFL, have any teams reached out to you? And I know that you probably don't want to go into detail about who some of them possibly are, but I would love to know the answer. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Now, one of the year head coach at Clemson was Dabo Sweeney. Everyone, he's a polarizing figure around college football and just the football community in general. What was it like playing for a coach like Dabo? I really have a lot of respect for Coach Dabo and just everything that he does from a holistic standpoint as far as just like creating and maintaining the culture at Clemson and really just driving – being the best and not selling for anything less. I have, a, I have a lot of respect for him in that regard. Yeah, I absolutely loved him. We're gonna, on our hometown, it, we uh, we went. I went to Damascus, and Brian Breesy, the freshman, just came from there. Um, so uh, Dabo was able to come up here, and everyone talked about how awesome he was. He was taking pictures with everybody. That's a that's a well known thing. Now, uh, the question that I have is. You grew up in Ohio, but the, you ended up choosing Clemson. What what really pulled you down to playing to Clemson? So, for me personally, I loved Ohio State. I really thought Ohio State was a great program. I was choosing between Ohio State, Southern California, Clemson, and Alabama. And for me, just like being able to get the chance to experience something new outside of Ohio and a new challenge, and making and making connections with people like Trevor and Xavier during recruiting and knowing that I was gonna be able to compete against the best college football defensive line in history mm. were all different things that I feel like really led to me choosing ultimately choosing Clemson. I really felt at home there. Yeah, and you're it, it speaks to because the stats show that. You guys, the Clemson offensive line was the only team in the ACC to allow two or fewer sacks uh per game. So you guys were phenomenal at that. I, I will say that you guys were top tier. Stone now, ball. Yeah. Thank now you. you growing up in Ohio, was there a team that you idolized growing up or a player that you just absolutely loved in your in your mind playing football? Yeah. Never really had a favorite team, but I've always had favorite players. Mm. Some players that really stick out to me like growing up watching Ray Lewis and Ed Reed when I was young cuz up until my sophomore year of high school I was a defensive lineman. Mm. Defensive tackle. Mm. And so having that defensive mindset and just like just the will and the drive just to smack somebody in the face right down the field. <laughs> it's playing fast and free and smart. They're all things I admire part of their game. And in the high school, I really love watching Julio Jones play. And I feel like a lot of offensive tackles, that's not really a common answer. Man. When you watch Jones, he's a wide receiver who has literally, in my opinion, no flaws in his game. And he does all the things that you wouldn't necessarily think a wide receiver would do. On the plays with a plays like the the ball's not going to him he's running full speed off the line if the quarterback throws the interception who's the first person to knock the defender's head off Julio and just being a well-rounded player and being physical and being smart and I feel like Julio really embodies all those things and you can really take aspects from his game as a wide receiver and translate them to the offensive line all right right now uh, we're gonna everyone knows obviously you're going through this draft process right now is there like a specific facility you're working out right now Working out at Michael Johnson Performance in Dallas with Duke Manny Nice, nice. Ooh, wow. Now, last year, th what really brought me to your film, Jackson, what really stuck out to me that said, this guy is a pro left tackle. I think that he can compete at the next level. Was watching that national championship game against Chase Young, who were Washington fans, the Washington Bay's podcast, and he was the defensive rookie of the year. What was that matchup like? for you going against Chase Young? Because to be perfectly honest with you, um, I hate to put my, my guy down a little bit, but you, I thought you did incredibly well against him. Yeah. What was it, What was that matchup like? That was one of the most fun games of my life, being able to compete with guys like that. I feel like me, as a 
football player and as a competitor, just like how I am, like personally, I love going against the best and like really challenging myself to see mm-hmm. how I can be. And he was definitely one of those like points in my career where I felt like I was just having a blast. And just like every play was just like music almost. And mm-hmm. like just being able to go against him and like, you know, say have the respect from him after the game. And I, I know the media really like blew a lot of stuff out of proportion leading up to the game. Mm. But there's nothing but love and respect both ways, like going towards it. And that was one of my favorite games of my career, just having the honor to go against him. And for Washington, one of our needs offensively is wide receiver. And I really do believe that Amari Rodgers and Cornell Powell should be a lot higher on guys' draft boards. Um, can you kind of give our fans a kind of look into how they are off the field and how talented you really – how they could be? So these two are guys that truly embody the word professional. Mm. I feel like they're people who really take themselves, their game, their body, and their mind as a business. And that's what you're going to get with them on the field and off the field. They're both highly competitive, highly talented. And even though they're so well polished, they have even so much more room to grow is what I really feel excited about for them. And I think they're both going to be stars at their respective positions. Right. And um, everyone obviously, like everyone knows you as this left tackle, stud left tackle, future first round pick in this upcoming draft. Uh, can you tell the fans something that we might not know about you off the field? Uh I really, I really love to cook, man. Mm-hmm. Um, I really love food. Like one of the things for me, like coming into college, was like learning how to recreate, re-transform my relationship with food and use it as an advantage to me. And now, like I feel like I'm really in tune with my nutrition and me being like completely in control of my body and my weight, my composition, and using it as a competitive advantage to me. And I feel like just being able to like make healthy food. It tastes like unhealthy food because we all know unhealthy food tastes better. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it like just like really being able to like just explore the culinary world, and I just I love cooking stuff like that. So, you have a uh, favorite dish you like to cook? I feel like my next one's always my best one. I love experimenting. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah, I made really big. If anyone's wondering. Ooh, <laughs> man, one day, man, one day. Now. All right. For one game last year against Notre Dame, uh, Trevor Lawrence was not able to play, and DJ came in, and I was very impressed with his film. But do you yeah. think that DJ has the capability to be one of the best quarterbacks in the nation in a first-round pick next year? Yes, I definitely. I feel like DJ would be good at whatever position he was playing because mm-hmm. he's really that athlete, that the rare type of athlete that can just fit in at any role. But as far as his arm talent, his IQ and his poise is really second to none. And it was really good for him to be able to learn under Trevor this year. I think next year he's going to take leaps and bounds compared to what you guys saw versus Notre Dame. And I'm really personally excited to see what he turns into. Yeah, absolutely. Jackson, I can't thank you enough for coming on. You, over your career, you played in 40 games. You finished your career playing 27 straight games. And I was very impressed with your film. I really hope the Washington football team takes a very, very hard look at you and is able to draft you because I'd absolutely love seeing you on this football team. Just, I, I thought my fil- your film was enough that convinced me, but your interview, your answers were absolutely perfect. I can't thank you enough for taking your time out of your busy day to come on and join us, sir. I really do appreciate it. Likewise, likewise. I really enjoy it. Appreciate you guys. Absolutely. Jackson, yeah, man, you have a good night, brother. Bro. Peace. All right, everybody. We just had the ability to talk to. That was incredible, dude. I yeah, mean, he's going to be a hell of a player at the next level, dude. Seriously, like that. How awesome was that? I mean, I, I, yeah. like I said, dude. You, everyone knows Jackson Carmen is a huge. I'm a huge mark for Jackson Carmen. Like I, yeah. I've talked about it many, many times. Being able to talk to him and not only just seeing his film and what he's capable of, because my player comp to him was Trent Williams, and to yeah. hear him say that. The, that the one player, the first one he talked about was Trent Williams was a huge slicer for me. Look, I mean, you already know I want a, I want a skill position at 19. I want a guy that's going to contribute to this offense. But look, you draft a guy like Jackson, he's going to contribute to this offense. And coming from a team that's had Chris Samuels for a decade, Trent Williams for a decade, what better way than to draft a guy like Jackson to have him been here for another decade and be a left tackle stable for this team? I mean, I would love that. And to hear him say how much fun – he had going against our own Chase Young, whose jersey I'm wearing right now. 
to hear him say that, that it was all love, that it was all competitive. You know, it just that like that's the kind of answer you would hear from Chase Young talking about that matchup. Yep, exactly. And like you said, he I'm not going to say he dominated Chase Young because no. no one really dominates Chase Young, but he definitely uh, definitely held his own against someone that's obviously the number two overall pick in the country, defensive rookie of the year. So the future is only bright for that guy, man. Dude, seriously, that was awesome. I didn't know that it, playing basketball, it's surfing. surfing yeah, I know. That's what's in like, snowboarding. I was like, what? That's how you know he's light on his feet, man, like a ballerina. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> the, dude, the, the dude is very athletic. If you guys haven't already, go check out Jackson Carmen's film. Uh, it is phenomenal. It's going to really jump out uh, at the film at you. And hearing that he's a film junkie, even on top of that, just yeah. tells you this kid is ready to work. He's ready to get it in. And then hearing the fact that he's like, look, I would much rather play left tackle. I think I could really do it and do it well. But saying, look, I'm, I'm also a team guy. I'm willing to work and do whatever I need to. If I need, they need to play right tackle anywhere in there, I'll, I'll do it. So a lot of credit to Jackson Carmen. Again, great kid. So happy that he was able to come on and talk ball with us. Now, For one sure. of the, one of the things that came up today, I'm not sure if you saw, Russell Wilson Hall. Russell Wilson mm -hmm. apparently had a meeting with the Seattle Seahawks, the brass, and stormed out of it. But his agent right afterwards said we he did not demand a trade because he does have the no trade clause. So, Hall, yeah. what do you think is going to happen, Russell Wilson? Do you think that he is going to get traded at some point? Uh, I do think he, at some point he'll get traded uh, unless they, like, all of a sudden get, like, a top five on the line this year. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, okay, I want to stay now. Hmm. But I think the damage has been done as far as, like, the seed's been planted that – he kind of wants out. I do think that uh, this is one of my theories. This is a lot of people's theory. I do think that Sierra's kind of in his ear, like, oh, 100%. I'm tired of living up here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm trying to, like, you know, go lower down the coast or, like, to one of these bigger cities so I can get back to being, uh, you know, the uh, world-famous CR. But with that being said, I do think that uh, he signed until 2023. They just gave him that big money contract, I want to say, about a year or two ago. So uh, I do think that after this season – I do think the the trade talks will pick up again. There'll be more discussion about him in the off season, this next coming off season. And I do think that in the start of the 2022 season, he will be playing for one of those four teams that he listed today, whether it's the Cowboys, the Raiders, uh, what was it? Miami and what other team? Oh, Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and Saints as well, I think was on that yeah, list, but yeah, yeah. somebody made a good point and said that he keeps flip flopping. Cause the other day he said the 49ers were on that list. Who's like a division rival. Right. Obviously, the Seahawks are not going to be trading you to their division rival, dude. Exactly. Especially Russell Wilson, who you could say is in his prime. You also got to you also got to think about like teams like the Cowboys, teams like the Saints, even a team like uh, Miami, who, who might be in play for Deshaun Watson or something like that. Because I don't know if you heard this uh, the news about Deshaun Watson. Apparently, he met he met the look, met with the head coach David Culley and pretty much told him straight up, "I respect you, I appreciate you meeting with me, but." This doesn't change anything. I'm I don't plan on playing for this organization mm. at all. So I think they are going to eventually move Deshaun Watson. But with that being said, back to Russell. Uh, damn, I kind of got like, see, I'm doing all that rambling. Forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, the teams like the Saints, teams like uh, Dallas. You would think that unless like Dak doesn't get the uh, franchise and he gets a long term deal, obviously Dallas is going to be out of the question. You would probably think that the Saints, even though they're in cap salary hell right now, probably would retain Jameis Winston for a multi-year deal. They're going to be out of the question. So what teams are – where else are you going to go? If Miami trade for Deshaun Watson, you can't go there. So who knows? But, yeah, I definitely think by 2022, Russ is uh, – out of there now to welcome to the show our co-host michael reed he did not want to jump in the middle of the carmen interview i know which, it's reed i'll tell you right now dude that dude I'm still good. Do, you have, do you have any idea how upset i am we've been talking about jackson carmen since i was at the beach this past summer that's yeah. like what we've been talking about jackson carmen one of the top offensive tackles what and i was so excited to meet him all of a sudden he's he's got to be there a little bit early so like we get we're like all right cool james decides the one time that i have to be there early to not follow his normal schedule and there we have it and i'm sitting there and i'm like i can't even come in in the middle of this interview because i don't want to ask the same questions and embarrass myself <laughs> no, <laughs> dude, was it, he he was good everything was good dude oh, it man. was incredibly impressive i, I yeah. can't wait for you to be able to listen i'm gonna to be i'm gonna I watch like a, i felt like a gym like the answers he was giving us i felt like a general yeah. man like, see, i, I, I want to ask you guys stuff about it but i guess i'll just have to watch it because yeah, uh, one of the questions he said I could ask 
was, has any NFL teams uh, reached out to you? And which ones right. were they? And he said, yes, sir. Literally, he was like, yes, sir. And that was still- it. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> which is perfect because, like, if you're the GM, that's what you want to hear. You don't want him telling people that you don't know. You talk to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's uh, reports and stuff. Like, you, you hear that leaked all the time. Like, uh, apparently, we met with Rondell Moore via yeah. Zoom. Rondell like, Moore, you, yeah. Rondell Moore, yeah, yeah. You got to think that, like, however that got leaked. Our, our coach and staff and GMs were like, all right, we'll mark you down a couple spots just because of the whole thing. Well, I think, I think that's Washington letting them know because I think Ken Burns is the one that tweeted that out. He also yeah. tweeted out earlier that at the um, at the Senior Bowl, they also met with Dwayne Eskridge. They met right, with Nico right, right, Collins. Right. So, so they're going in on wide receivers in this draft. Oh, yeah. Thank God. Yeah. They yeah. know. They know. They know and what's up. Speaking of wide receivers, I saw a compelling argument come across Twitter the other day, and that was Corey Davis or Curtis Samuel. What would you rather have for this offense, Reed? Ooh, that's tough because I, I feel like Corey Davis, can, I, I know he was a late bloomer, but he adds more upside, and he's more of a, a number two receiver where he's this big guy who could be opposite Terry. He's 6'3". He's super athletic. But the Samuel aspect, Curtis Samuel is such an offensive weapon. He's so fast. That speed element can't be taught. He knows the offense so well. And, and I just feel like he would complement Terry real well. Like him as mm-hmm. the bona fide number two receiver in a place with, uh, with uh, I mean, Corey Davis has been the number two uh, for the last two years with A.J. Brown's emergence. And they also have John New Smith, uh, who's the tight end, who's, who's a very big target, and that's a running team. Curtis Samuel had to play – third kind of third fiddle mm-hmm. on, on at wide receiver with Robbie Anderson breaking out and, and DJ Moore of course is their number one so I think Curtis Samuel would be very intriguing you can do so much with him he we always preach or I'm sorry Scott Turner and Ron Rivera always preach position versatility I think that you can line him up in the slot you can line him up outside he can use his speed to get deep kind of reminds you uh, in a way he would he would be the best deep there that we've had since uh, D Jack Santana Moss some, somewhere in there um so I'm gonna go with Curtis Samuel I'm a big Curtis Samuel guy I like Corey Davis more as a I think that he'll go somewhere where he could be the number one he's not gonna be a number one here mm. I think Curtis Samuel's the best fit yeah, I've heard you use that defense before, saying that Corey, Day, if he has the chance to go to Baltimore and be right. the bona fide number one uh, and have definitely more attention on him, that would make a lot of sense. Um, but me personally, I think I'd go with Corey Davis just because he has that six three ability. And right. one person Can't I forget, I, it might have been one account on Twitter. Um, that's literally his name on Twitter. Is one account. Um, he <laughs> said the- <laughs> he he brought a compelling <laughs> argument. He said, you know, I want our slot guy to be a bona fide slot wide receiver not a guy that you know there's just a gadget guy like curtis samuel is used and one aspect of it you have to think of when curtis samuel was with scott turner in that offense in carolina before matt roll he didn't really show out like he did last year right and so you have to it begs the question but is he still going to have that same productivity the same de- the same defense Corey davis didn't break out until last year either Corey exactly. davis struggled until last year well, well, I'm just saying, he's always considered a bust yeah i'm just saying within the system because the system, like, that, right, that right, system right. was there okay. two years ago he you're didn't right really yeah you're right out. you're right but you know then I mean? as soon as they get the offensive genius from lsu all of a sudden that changes yeah right. you're right you're right what about well, you yeah. all um yeah i'm kind of with reed where Corey davis is like the traditional number two he's the big body guy mm-hmm. he's not going to be a guy that's going to burn you deep he's more of like the the comeback route the dig routes the intermediate guy the guy's going to move the chains for you which obviously this team desperately desperately needs right but that being said you already know i've been on the curtis samuels train since last year when i knew he was going to be a free agent so uh and your the argument to him being that he was kind of downplayed in this offense that was also the year that Christian McCaffrey went for a thousand and a thousand. So like, that offense right, right. legitimately, literally ran through him. Right. And he was maybe like the second, or maybe even third option in that offense at that time because of DJ Moore. So yeah, uh, he was he was third. For yeah, sure. exactly. DJ Moore. So I definitely huge think year. maybe uh, even fourth with Johnny Smith. Yeah, exactly. So if uh, definitely if uh, Curtis Samuels came here, I definitely think that obviously they've been preaching the versatility in the offense. This is a guy that played running back at Ohio State in college. Um, he's definitely an upgrade to Stephen Sims. You could. You can That's, literally specifically mm. put him in the slot. You can use him as a gadget guy as well. Right. But you can also draft one of these big body guys. You got guys like Kelvin Harmon coming back, AGG, right. if you can say healthy in the second year, can be one of the big body outside guy. Um, me personally, I don't really believe in AGG being that guy. But with that being said, he can prove everybody wrong, especially me. So I definitely think that uh, I would go the Curtis Samuels route just because, again, I like a guy that's going to be versatile. He can line up anywhere. 
I'm just envisioning Antonio Gibson in the backfield or split out wide, vice versa, him and Curtis Samuels, J.D. McKissick in the slot or somebody like that, McLaurin on the outside and then X receiver on the outside or Logan right. Thomas in the slot. I mean, that's a lot of weapons, a lot of speed on the field at one time. And see, that that's where I, obviously we would all be okay with either one of these guys. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. Reports are we're interested in Corey Davis. And I, yeah. I, yes, good, go for it, please. Hey, get I'm looking both. at it, right, yeah, I, I'm kind of looking at – Right now, like, who would I rather replace? Hmm, Cam Sims or Steven Sims? And the answer <laughs> to that one for me is Steven Sims. Although I do think Curtis Samuel could also take Cam Sims' position right there on yeah. the outside. So, but yeah, uh, either one of them I'm cool with. One I'm, of the reasons both high on my board. Yeah, one of the reasons why I'm like I would rather have Corey Davis at that point is because Dwayne Eskridge is huge on my list. I think that he. Yeah, is a, you're right. One There's of those- a lot. I think he'd be the perfect second round pick for them. And he would slot in there at slot corner at slot wide receiver. He high points the football. He attacks the ball at its highest point. He brings down tough contested catches. He is incredibly good. And I think that he would be perfect for this offense and having the number two slot and number two wide receiver in Corey Davis, that'd be like a perfect match made in heaven uh, in my personal opinion. Uh, So I would absolutely love that. Like, and I don't want to make this like to be a thing like Curtis Samuel versus Corey Davis, but right. let me ask you, Mike, like, would you, would you like rather one of these two guys rather than going and paying Allen Robinson a buttload of money, which could possibly bite you in the butt later on if they get injured later down the road? Yeah, um, that's a tough one because obviously Allen Robinson is an elite or almost elite top. He's a top tier wide receiver in this league that doesn't get enough credit because he's been playing with bum quarterbacks his whole career, which – Obviously, honestly, in my opinion, could probably go in his strength because he's still putting up crazy numbers with guys like Blake Bortles and Mr. Bixby throwing him the ball <laughs> and Chase Daniels. But, uh, yeah, just because I'm one of those guys that's uh, one of the proponents of re-signing Brandon Sheriff, uh, if you get a guy like Curtis Samuels or Corey Davis, they're going to be less money compared to Allen Robinson. So that's uh, more money to sign guys, like re-sign guys like uh, maybe a Ronald Darby or something like that. Maybe uh, if you want to add another tight end to this, get a guy like Johnny Smith in there as well from Tennessee. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely – if I had, if I could, obviously I would love Allen Robinson on this team because him right. and Terry would be such a dangerous combination. But if it would save us money and go towards re-signing a guy like Ronald Darby or maybe another free agent like Johnny Smith, then I'm all down for that as well. So I'd probably pick the second choice. Yeah, look, I, I know that everyone keeps talking about Johnny Smith and they talk about Hunter Henry and everything. In my personal opinion, dude, I think the draft is the best way for that. I, Kenny Yaboa from yeah. Ole Miss, that dude is – if you look at Jeremy Sprinkle, he's the complete opposite of Jeremy Sprinkle. Right, the yeah. dude can literally run away from DBs. He's very, very fast. He catches a lot of contested balls. So I'll ask the same question to you, Reed. You know, would you rather one of these two guys in Curtis Samuel or uh, Corey Davis rather than going and paying Buku money to a guy like Allen Robinson or possibly Kenny Galladay if he doesn't get tagged or Chris Godwin? Um, yeah, I personally would, uh, just because uh, like, look, obviously Kenny Galladay and Allen Robinson and, and Chris Godwin, they're all such good wide receivers and, and that would be fantastic. The more talent you have, the better. Um, I just feel like Terry needs to be the established number one. We need to see what he can do with somebody who's talented, very good. Uh, Curtis Samuel, uh, uh Corey Davis, uh, Will Fuller, if he can stay healthy, uh, you can draft somebody, um, or I think they're going to draft somebody regardless. Uh, I, I just, uh, you're going to have so much money tied up with Brandon Sheriff needing to be resigned. You got to resign Ronald Darby. You're going to, I know Alex Smith being gone is kind of going to uh, open up some cap space maybe, but uh, I, I think that, yeah, I would much rather make sure that Terry is the bona fide, the, the, the number one. And I'm pretty sure the word bona fide is the word of the day on this show. Bonafide. Bonafide. We've Bonafide. used this that word about fifteen times already. <laughs> Have you <we> really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, but what one of the questions I had asked Hall, and he already answered it. But with the news of Russell Wilson basically walking out of his meeting with the Seahawks, do you think that there is a strong possibility that he will be traded this off season? Um, no, I, I still don't think so. Um, the, the, of course, all the reports coming out about the teams that he would want to go to, so he holds all the cards. I don't think it'll happen. Um, like the rumors of him going to Dallas, that's not going to happen. Even a, a Dallas reporter, I forget who I follow on Twitter was just, or on Instagram just tweeted out. She was like, that's laughable to us down in the media Slayer. down here. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. My girl. She yeah, was like, my, it's my boo. same. She was like, it's not happening. There's no <laughs> way. Um, 
then yeah, like the, the Raiders, the Jets, some of these teams, the Bears that he's saying that it's not going to happen. It's going to cost so much. And I honestly, I think that the Seahawks will get rid of Pete Carroll before they got rid of in yeah. this staff before they got rid of Russell Wilson. They're not. No, they're not. I would say I just thought of this. If he would happen to get traded this all season, the one place that I would love him to go to oh, sure. would be the Oakland Raiders, just because that would shake loose Derek Carr, and then we'd be right in the yeah. mix with Derek Carr. Your fascination yeah. with Derek. I literally Carr said that because I knew he was going to get reaction. It's amazing <laughs> how much he loves Derek Carr. It's crazy. Like, it's amazing how much you hate Derek Carr, Kyle. Yeah, that's a good question. That yeah, is true. It's a very good. It's because you look like him. I can't believe, sure. that, you I can't believe you... the Colonel said that. That's so funny. That's it is. Give so us true. the golf look. Give us the golf look. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. There it is. That's Do you it. remember that, dude? That was yeah, so yeah, weird. Yeah. But in he even posted on his Twitter account, like, "What a weirdo." Yeah. <laughs> but speaking of he the colonel the colonel has one question for us and one that's question, it this week yeah Just and that, it's very very okay. simple must and be a good one yeah yeah cam newton question mark <laughs> who are we starting uh, with let's go i'll all. go first because if you, <laughs> he's, he's already off it, dude. I saw today. <laughs> you yeah, saw my twitter today you know i'm off the train because look Literally the day before Hall was on the train. Hey, again. hey before you go, though, before you go, remember, Lewis Riddick also said that Dwayne Haskins was going to ball the hell out this year. You have to take that into consideration. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I'm not talking about anything Lewis Riddick said. Oh, I mean, was, Lewis, you quoted Lewis Riddick. Lewis Riddick's tweet about it. No, I didn't. It was Brian Mitchell. Actually, it was oh. J.P. Finley's tweet, but oh. I was I tagged Brian Mitchell on it because literally Brian Mitchell has been saying the same thing I've been saying for months. If you watched Cam Newton last year, Yes, there was a couple here and there. He had some great throws, especially in the first half of the season before the whole COVID thing. That's when he really kind of got affected and, like, his game went downhill. But if you watch some of those games, yes, he was throwing great balls. He was on time. He was accurate. But for every one of those great throws, those great two or three throws, there was another three, four, five throws that on those deep routes, those deep dig routes, those intermediate routes, those uh those out routes, which obviously if you can't throw an out route in the NFL, it's getting picked every single time. If you don't place it perfectly on the on the chest of the wide receiver, the face mask anywhere outside the numbers. So yeah, everything was skipping three to five yards short on the deep digs, the, the out routes, the deep outs, stuff like that. So and he even said what I've been saying, where it looks like there's something wrong with his mechanics, there's something wrong with his shoulder still, because when he throws the ball, it looks like he's putting his whole body into it and he's still skipping the ball three to five yards short. So, so yes. I'm off that train. I, I will that. rebuttal. I will rebuttal and say, remember that we talked about last episode that Cam Newton's completion percentage shot up after yeah. North Turner came to him and said, we're going to sit you in the pocket. We're going to make sure you're a pocket passer first. Remember that Seahawks game was one of the first games of the season and he was throwing the ball deep downfield. He was doing it accurately. It wasn't in that Josh McDaniels offense was literally centered around Cam running the football, embracing contact. I think with an offseason, there is a very good chance he could become healthy like he was in the first game that season. And if he's used by Scott the same way his dad said with Norv, I think that we could see what we saw in the last year in Carolina with that completion percentage. Because, look, we saw it with Alex Smith. We saw it with Kyle Allen not really attacking downfield, but just managing the game and just getting the ball to your playmakers. And you can win football games. So, in my opinion, you're probably right. Maybe the shoulder is bum. But I think that the way that their offense was running is the reason why his shoulder looked bad because he, I'm hundred percent certain he re-injured his shoulder running the football last year without that a doubt in my mind. Right. That was going to be my only one rebuttal is you're right. I hundred percent agree because Cam Newton under this Scott Turner office, when he said, we're going to make you a pocket passer. I think before he got injured, he was like at 67, 68. He was completing 67.8%. Yeah, yeah. He, he was, he was an MVP race. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, was like 7% higher definitely. than he's at, than he's ever completed. My only rebuttal to that would be, well, what if the soldier is not even 75 to 80% of what it was right. before the surgery? So that's why his mechanics are off. That's why he's like skipping ball. That's why everything's right. coming up short. But I do agree with you that he didn't run the ball a whole lot last year and maybe – that contributed to his shoulder yeah. getting pegged up. Well, you know, know Cam when he's running the ball, he's not sliding. I know COVID. I've like I said before COVID, he was he was everyone had everyone like wow, like Cam might lead these guys to the playoffs. COVID happened, he came back, and I know a lot of these athletes, NBA, NFL, any any sport, it takes a while to get their lungs back. They're not really right until like a couple of months down the line. Yeah. So maybe that's maybe that might be some of it too. Who knows? But 
Yeah, today at uh, 6, whatever the hell it is. I'm off six that train. Five. Always mark it down. Yeah. <laughs> and, and one thing I will say, and I think Ron Rivera is 100% correct with this, he will never downplay a healthy Cam Newton. And yeah. that's it's all predicated on him being healthy. And so yeah, my assumption 100%. is that he is going to be healthy with the offseason getting what he needs to be done. So th- th- I want to make sure that is very clear. Right. All predicated on if he's healthy. If he's healthy, I 100% want him on this team yeah, but if everyone yeah, is yeah. right and his medicals don't check out and he does have that bum shoulder then yes he shouldn't be on the team okay i will agree there 150 and I'll, i will agree with you on that if he's healthy even if he's 80 percent of 2018 cam i'm all on board for that i'm yeah I, i'm kind of where you guys are if healthy cam i'm 100 percent okay with taking a flyer on for the right price um reports were today of course like i said you can't believe anything that's coming out but no. reports came out saying that we're not going to be in the cam sweepstakes but how do you know that how do you know that like do we already have a quarterback in mind that we're going to go after that we're already like all right this is a guy that we're getting like so many things can happen to where even if you don't want to go after cam you have to go after cam like they're they're bringing in a quarterback this offseason i'll be okay with it like i said it depends on what happens this offseason depends on his health depends on the price tag but bring him in here for the right price i will never like you guys said i cam has never been the most prolific passer but the one season that they did say that, all right, we're going to make you a pocket passer. He did have a career year. Even his MVP season, I went back and looked at it. Kim completed 58% of his passes. Oh, no, the yeah, craziest thing, crazy. during that season, when Kaepernick had gotten benched, there was a time when people were saying Cam has similar numbers to Kaepernick and is the right. MVP, and Kaepernick is getting cut. And it was right. just a difference of them winning games or not. And so you're right. absolutely that, right. That's, yeah, that's kind of the big thing, I think, is win losses. And, well, there was a whole – other aspect yeah but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but one thing like remember in ron rivera was asked when marty herney and martin mayhew were introduced they asked him you know would cam newton come here would you be welcoming here and he said all options are on the table so the reporter right. saying they're not in the discussion that's ridiculous he already told you all options are on the table now right. i know jp keeps coming out with the same explanation with cam saying they didn't go after cam in the last off season do it in well, jp's voice no, I don't know JP's voice. But Call look. Todd, have Todd calling into it. Todd, <laughs> Todd does a good one. Todd just sounds like JP. Uh, but seriously, there was two factors in it, and that was I don't think Ron was convinced that his shoulder was healthy, and two, the fact that Dwayne Haskins was here and that yeah. Dan Snyder wanted Haskins to have a chance. You know damn well if you bring Cam Newton into the equation. what We saw when they worked out with Cam. In the offseason last year, Dwayne Haskins was like a kid meeting his idol. He was like, oh, yeah. man, Cam. Well, remember, I'm you like, even commented on that. Yeah. You, you were like, that's weird for an NFL player to do. You're like, yeah, because it wasn't like it was like two NFL players talking. It right. Was like a they kid weren't meeting equals. His idol. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, like, and if the- you bring Cam in there, that immediately downgrades Dwayne Haskins' confidence. And I right. really believe that, that I think Ron stood pat with that by saying it was my mistake not allowing a quarterback comp- competition. And that's where, to me, it says, look, I understand that you you say that if Cam would have come here, it would have been last offseason. I don't agree with that. I don't think the timing was correct. I think that's why they went after Kyle Allen and got him as a primary backup because they weren't sure if Alex was going to be ready for the season. They didn't think he was going to be ready at all. You know what I mean? Right, okay. So it made a lot of sense for them to go down that route. Now, now they're in a very precarious situation. They, they yeah. really have multiple aspects they can go here. And the way that this team is built, I'm telling you, it just, the way the body styles of these athletes, Logan Thomas, I think, fits a lot of what Greg Olson would bring. Not creating separation in his routes. He's a deep mismatch downfield that can catch the ball and block well. Terry McLaurin is like Steve Smith to me. The right. one wide receiver, Only baller, superstar. Bigger, right? Absolutely. And then the Antonio Gibson and J.D. McKissick two-headed backfield, it's reminiscent of D'Angelo Williams and uh, Jonathan Stewart, in my opinion. So I really do believe that this offense— And the defense, right. Exactly. I think I really do believe that this—I know that we're not going to get the MVP cam. I understand that. I'm just saying the similarities and body types and play styles are very reminiscent of what he had in Carolina. I just—if he's healthy, I'm all for it. You know what I mean? Because right. as long as it's under 10 mil, <laughs> right. yeah, like, I mean, <laughs> under 20 mil, you know what I mean? I was like 10 mil. All right. Hell yeah. Well, also you got to think though, at the end of the day, what was Tom Brady making last year? Like 25 million. Yeah. So like his baseline is pretty much going to be like, yo, you got to give me at least like, hopefully it'll be like if the, if he does come here, obviously if it's you know, like uh, a in concrete thing, but I would hope it would be like, like a, like a Taylor Heineke type contract where it's like, 
eight million dollars base or ten million dollar base, but it can go up to fifteen, twenty, whatever hell, twenty two million with incentives and stuff like that. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Now let's move on to another fan question from Corey Sanchez. If you guys haven't already, he's on Twitter, another podcaster, great guy. He does a really good job. He just interviewed Doc Walker uh, this week. His Man, question is. With the comments to GQ, do you think it's time to move on from Alex Smith Reed? Uh, yeah, I think that those comments pretty much sealed the deal. I think it was time to kind of move on anyway. Like you wanted to give Alex Smith the benefit of the doubt because it's Alex Smith and everything that he came back from. And you do have a winning record with him, like a, whether it's pretty or not. But yeah, that was pretty much a final nail in the coffin, in my opinion. I think Alex doesn't want to be here. Uh, I think the coaching staff, like Alex said, was never really 100%. Like this is our guy. Yeah, he's done. Yeah, he's not coming back. Yeah, and I, I agree think. with you. I think the writing was on the wall as soon as the season ended. Yeah. Them not him, him not being able to play in that playoff game. Them kind of worried about his injury, and they were look, they were scared to death that he was going to get re-injured, just like all of us were. And so, in my opinion, they were going to walk away, especially with the twenty-five million per. And then, like you said, Reed, this is just a, a putting him six feet under, essentially. No, I don't mean that because, like. Obviously, he almost nearly You're not passed. trying to kill him. No, he almost nearly passed. But I'm just saying, like, that was literally, like, the <laughs> exclamation point on saying that he is leaving. Way you to know? cover your tracks. And I, do really, <laughs> I really do think it's him forcing his way out sooner rather than later because he understands that some of these quarterback-needy teams, he wants to get ahead of that. If some of these teams start filling holes with these quarterbacks or being free agency or via trade or draft, he knows that his window is closing. But if he can get out there now, to be like the play, you're absolutely right. But like we said with Jacksonville, that would make a lot of sense personally. So, Hall, do you agree that yeah, it's done deal? Yeah, I'm just gonna be short. I believe we get what you just said. Where I think he's just pretty much trying to force his way out now, as opposed to like whatever the cutoff date in June is, where they can save the money. Because like you said, free agency is about to start in a couple weeks. I think it's like what two weeks from now. The draft is seventeenth. Yeah. Yeah. So like two and a half weeks from now. Uh, what's it called? The draft is in the the end of April, which is uh what, two months from now. So I mean, yeah, he's trying to get his way out now, trying to get to another place where he can kind of like establish something or at least come into a facility and try to work out with somebody and be like, hey, this is what I'm about. I can still provide X amount of knowledge, X amount of backup for you. So yeah, I definitely think that uh, like you said, the writing was on the wall during that playoff game, especially after watching Taylor Heineke did what he do, did what he did. Did what he do? Did what he do, bro? <laughs> did what he do? That was tight. That was, that tight. was real tight. That Thank was you, tight. Corey. That was a great question. Now, Scott Hartley, the Inquirer, has a the question. Inquirer. For us. He tagged the H Two We Are podcast. He tagged the DC Tweet Team in this podcast, and it's a really good question. I think you guys are gonna have a lot of fun with. Do you see any anybody of the wide receiving core making the roster next season besides Terry? He said, "I think Harmon and Cam Sims have a shot." And he think he's hoping that AGG can, but maybe he's practice squad. And I'll start with you, Hall. Uh, yeah, I definitely. Well, not definitely, but I do agree with them that AGG is probably going to be a practice squad fringe roster guy every single week. Uh, Cam Sims, I do think he'll be here. He'll probably be. Honestly, I think it's going to come down to between Cam Sims and Kelvin Harmon, who's going to get that, I guess, fourth receiver spot on the team. Um, I, I like Kelvin Harmon personally. I just think that Cam Sims can provide a little bit more as far as the blocking running game, especially this being like a heavily run predominant team, what they want to do at least. And uh, we just don't know how Kelvin Harmon is coming back off the injury. Like, I hope he comes back, bounces back, is healthy, can pro- uh, can provide some type of spark for this team in the in the wide receiver room and on the field. But uh, he was never really like a burner type of guy to begin with. So coming off of ACL, is his speed even like reduced slower now? Is he going to be back to like even 80% of Calvin Harden before the injury? So uh, I would go with AGG practice squad fringe guy and Cam Sims will make the roster. Yeah, and I do think that Cam earned himself the ability to be on the roster next season. I thought he, you can talk a lot about how bad the wide receiving core was, but Cam Sims showed out in really big times. And I think that he earned the confidence of this coaching staff to at least have a shot. You know, if you talk about Cam Sims as your number two or three, you're in a bad position. But if you're talking about Cam Sims being your fourth or fifth on the depth chart, that makes a lot of sense for you because you know that he can show out if you need him to. Uh, but Steven Sims, I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> I know you gave it your all. You had a great on, catch in that stop. playoff game. He had a great catch in that playoff game. It was a hey, great touchdown. No, hey, I'm hey. saying don't, don't, don't diss my boy. 
Stevenson is 100 percent making a team. So let me ask you, Reed, what do is you think is going to happen with the wide receiver core? Steven Sims is going to overtake Terry McLaurin as the number one wide receiver. That's a <laughs> given. Steven Sims is 100 percent gone. Thank, thank you. He's gone. Steven Sims is gone. No question. That's the one person I'm 100 percent sure about. Uh, <clears throat> I do think Calvin Harmon's interesting. I think he should make the team. I think we don't know how Ron and them felt about him coming out in the draft, but may- maybe I mean depending on what they see from him, I hope. So uh, he showed a lot his rookie year. Uh, that's for sure. I, I think he'll be here. Um, Cam Sims is tough because I know his contract is up. And But he did – he showed some – he showed flashes and he showed that he can be effective in this league. It's just, can you get it consistently or can you just get somebody better? You're just going to replace him with AGG. I, I'm kind of the same. I do think a full off season will help him. Um, so that that'll be interesting, but yeah, I don't know if I, that we could see a complete wide receiver rehaul. Will mm-hmm. we? Right. I don't know, but they're definitely doing their due diligence on wide receivers in the draft and it, them going and scouting like Dwayne Eskridge and Amani Rogers and some of these people show that they're kind of looking at some people in the middle rounds, mm-hmm. uh, the second to middle rounds. And I'm sure they're also looking at the people in the early rounds. There's a and lot free of agents there. Apparently receiver. they're connected to Corey Davis, Curtis Samuel, Allen Robinson's always been thrown around Kenny Galladay, like all these people. So they they really might rehaul the entire wide receiver core. Mm-hmm. Will they? I don't think so. I think that they'll still be like Kelvin Harmon, possibly Cam Sims, Isaiah Wright. I know that Scott Turner really likes, um, <clears throat> But hey, I wouldn't count it out. No, not at all. I'm yeah. actually gonna like flip flop my answer because I didn't know Cam Sims' contract was up, so I yeah. don't. I don't see him coming back with a new contract. So I'll flip Kelvin Harmon and Cam Sims. Kelvin Harmon will probably make the squad as a fourth, maybe fifth guy. I don't think Cam Sims will be back, but I would love to have Cam Sims back. Yeah, yeah I, I think for very, very cheap. I, I'm just saying back as in it able to compete. Now, do I think he's going to make the roster yeah, come right, right, one? Right, 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 right. I yeah. think that is the bigger question. Um, yeah, I definitely think true. he'll be given a chance to compete just in case of injury. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, Washington you know Twitter is probably like, resign him, trade him for Deshaun Watson, and then we're. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. Great question from you, Scott. Thank you. Now, Tony, uh, no, well, Tony has a question for us, Tony Shivers. He said, based on Shivers what, me timber. We're, we're just talking about uh, wide receivers and who's going to make the team or not. <clears throat> Who in the draft would you like to see returning kicks for the Washington football Ooh, team next season? Can I, can I start here? Let's go. So this one is interesting to me. I, I was thinking about uh, kick returners literally yesterday, and, and I was looking at the draft, and uh, there's some interesting people back there. I mean, there's some people that can do a lot, like Rondale Moore, obviously, is a fantastic mm. return man. But somebody that really interests me in, in the late rounds is Puka Williams. Mm. Puka, it, 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 it's Puka Williams, right? Oh, yeah. Let me double check. Yes. Kansas. Yes. Yeah. Puka. Puka is he's undersized. He is a he's only 170 pounds at, at like 5'10", 5'11". Um, he's a running back, but he is a very dynamic player. He, he's somebody who I think could definitely make the roster as a return man. Uh, he specializes. He's got good agility, good burst. Um, he's somebody who I could definitely see. That us taking a flyer on in the late rounds or even as an undrafted guy just strictly as a return person and i'd be completely okay with that he's somebody who can catch the ball uh, you, you could use him as a receiver out of the backfield or even just switch his position to receiver based off of his size so puka williams is somebody who i'm interested in um as, as a late round name that nobody's really talking about to return kicks yeah for me it's uh Dwayne eskridge um I, he is phenomenal with the football he's very quick he's elusive uh, and he always catches the football, and that's very important, obviously, returning kicks. Another guy like Tamorian Terry um, out of Florida State, big, long guy. He's fast as all hell in open field. That dude is a strider. I say, think. Does he does he return kicks? No, but if you come to this you team, can, right. yeah, you could. Yeah, make oh, them. yeah, yeah, you have to. You have right. to make it with special teams. Yeah. Exactly. And then uh, uh, somebody else I was thinking of, and it completely slipped my mind, of course. Um, but is like Sage Surratt, uh, possibly somebody like that could really help you in that aspect. So I would like to go down that route. I definitely think the draft is the right mindset here, Tony. I think you're on to it. What about you yeah. all? Yeah, uh, I guess one of the, the first people that comes to my mind is a guy that's been mocked to us at 19. Now, I don't like him at 19, but if they want to draft a receiver from second round to third round, wherever it is, is it all- I would look at Darius Tony. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Get drafted in the second round. Swiss Army. Uh, he- Swiss Army knife, exactly. He's got to be, again, the versatility aspect. I think that he could be a day one contributor to this offense. And if not on this offense, I do think that he definitely contribute in special teams. He has a, like right. you said, a Swiss Army knife, has the speed, agility, can break tackles. So I definitely think that uh, he is. He returned punts at Florida last season. So I definitely think that uh, he's a guy that would be on the lookout for in the second round. Not in 19, 
in the second round. Yeah, I'm right, right. there with you. Way to save yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mike is always over in the UK. Has a great, great line of questions for us. And the oh, first real fast, one, Anthony Schwartz too from Auburn. Ant- okay, he's so fast. He's someone who look out for wide receiver. Right. Now, the first question from Mike is Trent Williams. Would you welcome? Would he? Do you think he's going to be back here in a Washington We've- uniform? Read. We've answered this one before. No, um, would we all love Trent? We all are big Trent fans, but short, no. I mean, just the relationship. I know Trent sees what's going on here, and he might be like, okay, yeah, but no, he's not. We got by. If you can get by and do perfectly fine with Cornelius Lucas on that contract, you're not signing Trent to a huge contract. I could see him drafting somebody, but no, you're not bringing Trent back. I mean, yeah, no if he chance. wants to take a huge pay cut, then yeah, dude. Yeah, but uh, right. We just interviewed Jackson Carmen, who I every mock draft that I do, I draft him Always. in the third round with one of those picks. He, <laughs> he could go higher now. Yeah, absolutely. I he think can go he round can. Two. Maybe and, even late round one. And it's funny, Reed, because you know what was my comp for Jackson Carmen? I don't remember. It was Trent. Trent it was Trent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we Trent. asked him, "What player do you like model your game around?" And the first player he said was Trent Williams. Did he and, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh hell yeah. And we asked him, like, you know, would you do you envision yourself being a left tackle? Because there's some people saying that you could possibly play guard. And he said, "Look, 100. percent I think I can be one of the best left tackles in the league. And but I'm also a team guy. And if and if I'm on a team, the best thing that we need to do to get to a Super Bowl is me playing on the other side or inside. I'll do that." Damn, you, that, I like to hear that. That kind of versatility is what you really need in that third round pick. Making sure you can get a guy that says the right things, will do the right things, won't be a thorn in your backside, like I.E. Trent. So no, I don't think that Trent will be back. I would much rather go down through the draft. There's so much depth at tackle, in yeah. my opinion. Anything to add, Hall? No, I'm with you. I mean, if he somehow was like, "Hey, I'll take like the vet minimum, or I'll take like he, <laughs> and that's huge not happening after not his happening. PFF year. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. you think vets? You think Trent Williams is gonna take less money any at any point in his career? Right. Hell no. Yeah. So, yeah, if he's like I said, if he's down to take less money, like a lot of less money, of course I would love to have welcome Trent back because right. he's a future um, friends Hall of <sighs> Fame left tackle. That's what, that's yeah, what I'm saying. I mean, like, people have never given him the respect he deserved. Right, besides, of course. Like, of until course he left honest, Washington. And then until he left Washington. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. I always <laughs> say that because Chris Samuels was like all pros and blah, blah, blah. And he's not in the Hall of Fame yet. So that's why I'm kind of yeah. like. But but Chris Samuels also, I hate to say it. I know I'm going to get a lot of shit for it. Chris Samuels was over a little overrated, in my opinion. Just with, in terms of his t- untimely penalties. And I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just I'm yeah, just on yeah. the boat where Chris Samuels was a little. I love him, but I think Trent's a better player. Yeah, you're right. No, Trent's definitely the better player, more athletic, all that stuff. But, yeah, like I said, if he's willing to take a huge pay cut or the vet minimum right. or some ridiculously non or non-expensive contract, of course, because, guys, like I said before, that's a dude that was a staple our left tackle for 10-plus years. But other than that, I think the ship is sailed. He burned his bridges, and it is what it is. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, the next question is, should we re-sign Dustin Hopkins? As of right now, yeah. he is going to be a free agent hall. Oh, uh, man, old Dusty boy. Um, I don't know, man. I like Dustin Hopkins. He's been here for a while. These last couple of seasons, he's been, like, going downhill, like, slowly but surely. So, look, if they want to bring him back on, like, again, another on the cheap. I know kickers don't make a lot anyway, but if they want to bring him back on the super cheap and then have a competition with someone else, I'm all down for that. But just to outright give him the job and re-sign him again, yeah. I think we should. And I think that Washington fans in particular just don't really realize what they have at sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, because Harrison Butker, who is a fantastic, one of the best field goal kickers in the league, was missing un- untimely kicks. It happens, dude. You go through that. And Dustin Hopkins did ha- does have his spurts. But at the same time, there's no telling that, he, that you're going to bring somebody else in and they're not going to have the same blunders. You know what I mean? Obviously, Dustin Hopkins cost us games last year, but look, he's familiar here. He's a great locker room guy. Tressway loves him. Nick Sunberg loves him, who also needs to get re-signed, by the way. He just had yeah. uh, elbow surgery. Br- yes, I really do believe bring Dustin Hopkins back because he's – you feel comfortable with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I'm kind of with you, Kyle, but I'm – on the fence where you bring him back in a competition. You want to see, you want to get exactly. the best out of him. Bring him back, sign somebody else, bring them in, have, have a straight up. Didn't they battle. sign Kyer uh, Vedvik and he was like on the practice squad last year at some yeah, point? Yeah, but uh, maybe somebody a little bit more established or, or, yeah. or <laughs> somebody younger that, that can come in. Yeah, I mean, sometimes kickers come out of nowhere all the time, so you yeah. never know. Maybe, maybe I mean, dude, be, but, but how many times have we had Washington have great kickers that, here that we end up cutting and, and then, then we cut them? Graham Gano. 
Graham yeah. Gano, uh, even Nick Novak had success places. Yeah. Like, there's so yeah. many, there's so many Cock kickers. Corbett. That, Look at Cock Corbett. Yeah, there's so many. What kickers was the kicker that, that Philly had for a really long time? The older dude, then he was literally uh, like a Hall David of Akers. Fame. Yeah, David Akers. Yeah. He was here. We cut yeah. him. He goes to Philly, <laughs> yeah. and then he's like a Hall of Fame. Field he's goal there kicker. for 20 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there, there's a lot like that. And that's what I'm worried about with Dustin Hopkins. Uh, and plus, I kind of think we owe it to him. He's been such a staple here. He's he really like. There was such a revolving door at kicker for such a long time. Dustin Hopkins comes in, kind of solidifies it for a few years. And I know he had a tough season, but was it just the injury? Who knows? He was hurt most of the year. So bring him back, bring in some competition for him and just see whoever wins that. That Cool. But I think we owe it to him to at least give him a chance. Yeah. Now, our last question, we already kind of answered this, but Tony Franchise wants to know, depending on if we re-sign Sheriff, are there any other O-line moves that need to happen, Reed? Um, yeah, you can, like we said, you can never have too much depth on the offensive line. Originally, I was of the mindset to where I saw like people taking a left tackle early on in the draft, and I, I've been such a big Cornelius Lucas supporter that I was just like, no. But I'm kind of, I'm on the line now with, with Washington's injury history, and if you yep. can get a Christian Darisaw or, hey, even an Elijah Vera Tucker, if you see him as a left tackle, even though I think a lot of people think he's a guard, I, I think he could play left tackle in the NFL. He's very good. Um, or maybe it won't happen, but if Rashawn Slater falls somehow uh, and you see him as a left tackle too, uh, yeah, I think you can. There's a lot of good left tackles in this draft. Mm -hmm. I, I think that not tackle and guard, you can always improve on. Uh, I think you could you could draft somebody to be a guard. You, you could draft future left tackle. Dylan Radins can play both out of North Dakota State. He's somebody you could bring in to compete. Uh, you, Jerron Christian's not the guy, so regardless, you need a swing tackle. So whether you take somebody early or in free agency and you make them the starting left tackle, have Cornelius Lucas the swing tackle or vice versa, you draft somebody there the swing tackle, yes, I think you have to upgrade the depth at least on the offensive line. You're 100% right about that. But the one issue I, know, I have I with the 19th pick there is there's so much we, depth so other, at left yeah. tackle that when you look at linebacker, the depth is not that – Exactly. Much. And right. so after that's the where, second round, exactly. Nobody. And that's where I'm at, where I would rather have that value pick. Maybe they trade back to 23, you know, because Jacksonville has the 23rd overall pick. Maybe they need to go get a playmaker for Trevor Lawrence or they or need to go get tackle or left tackle. tackle. And you trade yeah. back, get some extra picks for you. Then you go get your Zayvon Collins, your Nick Bolton. Yeah. And it makes a lot right. more sense. And then you start to retool the chest after that with the plethora of wide receivers, the plethora of tackles and guards in this draft. So that's the avenue I'd rather yeah. go down. I do not want to use that. I love Christian Darisol, obviously. Yeah. I just don't but there's, want that 19th pick used on that position when there's so much draft. There's yeah. people like Tevin Jenkins and stuff that you can take a little bit later that, that are just yeah. – There's a dude You're named, 100% right. I, a, I would rather have – There's a dude uh, named Deon, Deontay Smith out of ECU. Yeah. Yep. He's, he he's very interesting. He out yep. at the Senior Bowl. Yeah, I mean, he dominated bowl, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, and he's athletic yeah. as hell too for a left tackle. Just, yeah, no, I saw a lot of his clips from the practice week. He was killing people in the, the, in the drills. Him. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm with you guys. You got to definitely add some depth to the draft. Uh, you can never have enough young guys, especially on rookie contracts and those vet, those minimum contracts to kind of build around your team. Add some depth. Uh, Jackson Carmen comes to mind. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I mean that's where I'm at with you guys. Where you got to build some depth. Injury history is doing a, a big thing with this team for not really last year as much, but in the years past. Yeah, we got lucky last year. But remember the or, years before that. Or was it just a whole new training staff? That's that's what, yeah, right. But I was, I was about to say, remember, for like three straight years before that, it was injury, yeah. injury, yeah. injury, injury. Yeah. That was my thing about – that's to, to keep talking about offensive line. That's my whole thing about Brandon Sheriff where it's like, yes, he's been injured or whatever, but was he coming back solely from the injuries in the past because of the old training staff? Right. Or was it the new training staff that got him like, oh, we diagnosed an injury. We're giving him this type of treatment. He came back faster now. So that's my whole thing about the whole uh, Brandon Sheriff thing, yeah. talking about that. And the, the injury history is a huge concern in dealing with this contract if for me personally. You know, I, obviously he had a great year last year, all pro. Really happy for him. I really hope that he does get paid. The whole question is just how much. How much? Well, the it, crazy thing is they're talking about franchising him. Where I'm like, why would you want to pay him? Per. That's a lot. You can, you can pay him like 15 or 16 and keep him locked up for a couple of years rather than just one year for 18. Like that would 
be crazy to me. It, that but. is insane. But the one thing I was thinking, like, the one- or two-year deal with the second year out would make a lot more sense because you, you have to make sure that they prove to you. He has to make sure he proves to you that he can stay healthy if he is getting a contract like that. You know what I mean? So the yeah. last thing you want to do is sign him to that long-term deal and him getting injured for the entire season and being like a kind of Alex Smith situation where you got this dude on the hook, $16 million, and he's sitting on your bench for 15 games. You know what I mean? Yeah, but that, that's like any player, though. You know what I'm saying? Any player can but sign it. I know. I understand. But this is a guard, though. Like, this yeah. is a completely different situation than it is if it's a left hey, tackle where that money's give, worth it. You want to give Terry the extension now? What if he comes out and blows his ACL? Knock on wood. But I'm just saying, you want to give Terry the extension now, and all of a sudden he goes down, then you're strapped on the hook for that too. You know what I'm saying? So that's where I'm kind of like. It's harder got, to replace Terry than it is for. I know. But I'm just saying in general, if you got the talent, you got to pay the talent. Yeah, I got that's you. where I'm at with it. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I completely agree. I agree especially, with both especially, of you guys. The home, especially the homegrown guys. Like, when's the last time we really like retained our guys? You know what I'm saying? Like, right. Rarely, if ever. Exactly. That, that's why. Look, I'm okay with the contract extension as long as it's like a short contract extension, like everyone keeps talking about with these, yeah, these because like of the COVID year. year like, yeah. yeah, the one, two, three year deals with a second year out, whatever. That would be perfect in my opinion yeah. because you're not handcuffed to them. You can leave it at any time, and if injuries are a concern, you can always cut the hook. But the yeah. four to five year deals, that's where I start yeah. getting iffy with it. You know what I mean? Thanks a lot, Kevin Zeitler. I know he, yeah, the I Browns know. blew the market right yeah. out of the roof, dude. It's insane. You you, you had the chance but, and you goofed it. I you goofed it. it. It was worth it though because look at the Browns' running game and what they did for it well, last year. Zeid, so. Zeidler's on the Giants now. Yeah, that's true. No, yeah, he's not even there. They were like, all right, peace out. <laughs> but they did. I do I do love the way that they built their offensive line though. The Browns' they, they did. offensive line is. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this show. Special thank you to Jackson Carmen for taking the time out and being able to Zero. talk the draft with us, talk Clemson football, talk about his matchup against Chase Young and in the National wait Championship to listen game. To it. Thank you. You yeah. guys asked him all that. You guys asked him about Trevor Lawrence, did you? No, yep. yes. Yeah. Did. Good, thank God. I can't wait to listen, guys. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. We asked we him about uh, Breezy, too. We See, that, that's why I didn't want to jump in because all the questions I had, I was like, they're going to ask these already. I can't <laughs> just jump in there and him be like, yeah, I already answered that. He would just gave you the stone face like. I already answered it. <laughs> and I would have been like, wow, you are intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a great time and a fantastic interview to say the least. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We're going to have some great guests lined up for you guys next week. I already got some uh, down in the chamber, some bullets in the chamber ready to go. So make sure you check us out on Tuesday, everybody. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall, and I'm off the cam train again. <laughs> Jesse will be happy about that. Jesse was literally going after you on <laughs> his know, pod. Man. <laughs> hey, man, Keith. Oh, wow. Oh, Oh man. Oh, they I, were. Oh, I'm about to listen to that shit. Yeah, he yeah said, go listen he, to that hall, he, hall, and then get ready. He said you're a traitor. <laughs> Oh, oh what? Yeah. I've been called that hall. I've He's been a, called worse. That's true. That's <laughs> we were talking Looking about at this. you, Cleve. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were just talking about that, actually. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. I'm Kyle. We're you already know who I am. Uh I'm I'm Ryan Cleveland. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week. All right. Peace out. Washington football. Hey! What's up, everyone? This is Kyle from the Burgundy Zone. We are releasing our own merch to support the show. If you want to rock the Burgundy Zone logo or you want to see Reed's face on your shirt, we got it. We're starting with t-shirts, hoodies, and zip up. So if you're a fan of the show, make sure you snag one before they are gone. Check out the link in our bio on Instagram, or you can find the link in the description of the video. Thanks again for all your support. Until next time.